in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, you sent us your Son to reveal to us that your care and your love for humanity knows no distinction of race, culture, or gender. Give us a spirit to respect others and to embrace all cultures. We make our prayer through Jesus, the Good Shepherd, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in our catechesis today, we wish to reflect on the parable of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. John chapter 10, verses 11 to 18. In this parable, Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but the hurry. He who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Jesus says, The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. But he says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My own know me. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice. There will be one flock and one shepherd. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus puts his soul succinct that he is the good shepherd. In comparison to other leaders of the people of Israel, such as Pharisees, religious leaders, scribes, and Sadducees, he observes that the true and good shepherd loves and cares for his sheep. Even in times of danger, misfortune, suffering, and tempests. However, the hired one only loves and cares for himself. And when danger approaches, the hired one runs away leaving the sheep vulnerable and at the mercy of thieves and wolves who scatter and kill them. The interest of the hard one is purely monetary gain and has no interest of the sheep. Therefore, the hard one is unfit to be entrusted with people because he or she is uncaring, selfish, insensitive, and has neither the love of God nor that of man. Further, the hard one will not bother to look for the strayed ones, but the good shepherd will look for the other sheep which have been scattered and Beleba to bring them back, so that there'll be one flock and one shepherd, and all of them will hear his voice. This parable, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the parable of the good shepherd brings out contrasting images between Jesus, the good shepherd, and the Pharisees as well as the religious leaders 
of the people of Israel. Accordingly, these are false shepherds who do not enter the sheepfold that they get, but climb in by another way. Favor, they do not have the best interest of the sheep at heart, but they come to steal, kill, and destroy. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our gospel text of a good shepherd has its background in the story of the man born blind who was healed by Jesus. John chapter 9, verses 1 to 34. And the healing took place on the Sabbath, in the days following the Feast of the Tabernacles. Jesus is consequently accused by the Pharisees of violating the Sabbath by healing a man born blind beside the pool of Siloam. Instead of them rejoicing with this man who is now able to see for the first time, the Pharisees sought an opportunity to condemn Jesus for breaking the Sabbath law restrictions. The Pharisees looked down on the common people as beneath them. They held themselves in high esteem as pious Jews intent on rigidly enforcing the letter of the law. They were also openly hostile and increasingly aggressive towards Jesus and his growing influence among the commoners. And as a result, there are three heated exchanges which follow the Pharisees' rigid accusation of Jesus as violating the Sabbath, and each conflicted exchange evolved in two themes the shepherd, the flock, and the sheepfold. Constantly, complex images of sight and insight. Darkness and light, belief and unbelief, good and bad leadership, inclusion and exclusion are intrinsically intertwined into the heated discussions. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, which is a direct challenge to the scribes and the Pharisees who had set themselves up as the spiritual shepherds of the nation. When the Romans had besieged Jerusalem during the recent Jewish war, many of the Pharisees fled, leaving their flock unprotected in the face of the brutal Roman army. And when the Romans came back and attacked Israel again, Communities were disseminated, and vast numbers of Israelites were scattered to the four corners of the known world. And in stating categorically that he is the good shepherd, where good equates with honor and integrity, Jesus is condemning the Pharisees, the religious leaders as well as the priests and the scribes, not only for their spiritual blindness and moral corruption, but also for their physical cowardice. The accusation is spelled out loud and clear. The hired hand sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Thus, actions speak louder than words. The hard hand saves his own skin. The faithful shepherd is prepared to die for his sheep. 
my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the Pharisees are self-saving hard hearts who are deaf to the word of God and blind to the true spirit of the Lord. Further, the negative images of the gospel passage are veiled metaphors for the Pharisees who in their encounter with a formerly blind man reveal themselves to be uncaring about the blind man and heedless of the truth. Their actions are selfish and have nothing to do with the love of God or of man. Looking back into the ancient Near East, we see that shepherding was considered one of the oldest of human occupations. And the principal animal, owing to its size, abundance, and usefulness, was the sheep. Sheep provided for the ancient peoples meat, milk, fat, wool, skins, and horns. Thus, the economic importance of the sheep, besides being sacrificial animals, cannot be underestimated. Therefore, the principal duties of a good shepherd were to guide, provide food and water, protect and deliver, gather back to the head those sheep that were lost, and to nature and provide security for them. Confer Psalms chapter 23. The Old Testament, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, correctly reflects the milieu of shepherds and their flocks. Shepherds are mentioned a number of times throughout the Old Testament. The Old Testament application of the shepherd image to Yahweh is embodied in the living piety of the people of Israel. One good example of this is found in Isaiah. The prophet says, God who feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Confer Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. Thus, the claim that God is my shepherd is unparalleled in Scripture. And this familiar metaphoric title for God actually appears in only two other Psalms, chapter 28, verse 9, as well as chapter 18, verse 1. The shepherd God goes before his flock, leading them to the pastures and to places where it may rest by the waters who protects it with his staff and gathers the dispersed. The flock Israel is safely sheltered in God. Psalm 23 portrays the shepherd as meeting all the needs of his sheep. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. This divine shepherd restores my soul. However, in the midst of Israel's false leaders or shepherds who exploited their position to save themselves, the prophet Ezekiel gave an assurance of the one shepherd God who provide a messianic descendant of David who feed his flock and be their shepherd. The Lord God says, 
I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks, when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places in which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. Confer Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 and 12. The first person to be mentioned as shepherd in the Old Testament is us. However, principal characters of the Old Testament as shepherds include the following. Abraham, Moses, and King David. In the New Testament, the term shepherd is used by Jesus. In another pericope, we see Jesus asking Peter, do you love me? When Peter said that he loved the Lord, he was told to feed my lambs, shepherd my sheep, feed my sheep. John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. God's sheep are his people, those who follow him. So, Peter was to demonstrate his love for Christ by caring for the people of God like a shepherd who cares for his sheep. Feeding implies teaching, while shepherding implies pastoral care. And the lambs who are those who are young in their Christian faith. Later, Peter wrote to his fellow apostles, to the elders among you are pure as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Peter says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, saving as overseers. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to say. Not loading it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. Confer 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. Peter used the image of shepherds and sheep. The elders in the local church are the shepherds and the congregation are the sheep. It's God's flock. And the elders work for him, the shepherd under the chief shepherd. Thus, they are to be willing and eager to save and not to be reluctant. They ought to be good examples, not selfish or bossy, nor dictatorial. So the elders were shepherds in the, in the early churches, They were leaders who cared for the welfare of fellow believers. Hence, the shepherd is not only descriptive of the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep, but it means becoming shepherds, caring for the sheep, even laying down one's life for the sheep. The mutuality of the shepherd and the sheep moves beyond the recognition of the shepherd to doing the shepherding. And dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us now revert to our text of our 
the cases. It reads in part, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who doesn't own the sheep sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. The hard hand flees because is a hard hand does not care for the sheep. John chapter 10, verses 11 to 13. My dear and sisters in Christ, Jesus opens his address by saying, I am the good shepherd. The I am may be understood as coded language that refers back to Moses' encounter with God many centuries earlier. And on that occasion, when Moses asked God's name, God replied, You shall tell the children of Israel this, I am has sent me to you. Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Also in Isaiah chapter 40 up to 55, God uses the phrase I am over and over again to refer to himself. In other words, I am can be construed as God's name. Therefore, when Jesus applies I am to himself, he is subtly identifying himself with God as God the good shepherd. Therefore, the I am statement tells us that Jesus is the one who can guide, who can provide, who can protect, who can deliver and nature and bring abundant life to his people. I am the good shepherd in the sense of superlative. He is good in comparison with other shepherds who are not. And reading through the Old Testament tradition, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we note that the image of the shepherd is God. The Old Testament uses shepherd as a metaphor for God. Confer Genesis chapter 48 verse 15. Chapter 49 verse 24. Psalms chapter 23 verse 1. Chapter 28 verse 9. Chapter 80 verse 1. As well as Isaiah chapter 40 verse 11. The same terminology is used for personalities such as Abraham, Moses, David, and Amos, not on account of their work, which they might have done, but because they were called by God to guide his people. Confer Numbers chapter 27. Verses 16 and 17. To Samuel chapter 5, verse 2, as well as chapter 7, verse 7. 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 2, chapter 17, verse 6, as well as Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this brings to mind David, the shepherd boy, who slew a lion and a bear in defense of his sheep. Confer 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 35 and 36. Surely, some shepherds lose their lives trying to protect their sheep 
from all the animals or thieves. Others lose their foot. As they search for the lost sheep at night, suffering injury, even death. Thus, being a shepherd, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is not a responsibility for the faint hearted. However, Jesus goes beyond that as he says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. While a good shepherd does not go to the field intending to die, Jesus will do exactly that in obedience to the Father. Jesus came into the world to die on the cross. And it is in his death, the death of the Lamb of God, that saves us from our eternal death. Confer John chapter 1, verse 29. Revelation chapter 7, verse 17. It is the Lamb's victory over death, which assures us of our own victory over death. Jesus continues to say, He who is a hard heart, not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep, and flees. The wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. The hard hand flees because he is a hard hand and doesn't care for the sheep. The missionary required that a hard hand to protect the sheep from one wolf, but was not responsible if more than one wolf was involved. Against this backdrop, Jesus contrasts the good shepherd with a hard hand, a mercenary for that matter, whose concern is his views. He has no affection. A great responsibility for the sheep because shepherding is not a calling for him, but purely a job. He would run away from danger, allowing the wolf to snatch and scatter the sheep. Such a hard hand would tend the sheep as long as the offer still remains. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the hard hand flees because he is a hard hand and doesn't care for the sheep. Having a hard hand, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as a shepherd, is worse than having no shepherd at all. The hard hand gives the illusion of protection, but without protection. If the owner has no shepherd, he will work to find work. If he has a hard hand, the owner will relax, thinking that the hard hand was doing his job and that his sheep were safe. But alas. And Jesus exposes and accuses the Jewish religious leaders, especially the Pharisees, as wicked shepherds, who are not concerned for the hurting and the troubled sheep and abuse the sheep of God's flock for their own personal gain. Thus, the fundamental criterion for to discern who is a good shepherd and who is a thief is the defense of the life of the sheep. Jesus ask the people not to follow the persons who present themselves as shepherds, but who have no interest for the life of the people. And he says, I've come in order that they may have life and life in abundance. This is the criteria 
Jesus the good shepherd showed the full extent of his selfless love for the flock by dying for them. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep as a ransom for many. The wolf snatches the sheep and scatters them. The wolves devour, snatch, and scatter the sheep. Wolves devour life. They destroy abundance. Wolves come in all sorts of shapes and sizes in our world today. Sometimes it's the wolf of business, the wolf of achievement, the wolf of needing approval, or the wolf of having to be right and in control. And sometimes it is the wolf of fear, or the wolf of anger, and the wolf of resentment. Or maybe it is the wolf of failure, the wolf of despair, the wolf of brokenness. All this destroys life at its roots. The hard hand or worker is neither a hero nor a villain. However, he becomes a villain because of what happens to the sheep in his care. He fails to recognize the importance of his work. His indifference is, however, likely to result in the death of the sheep in his care. And the tragedy, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is that men who masquerade like shepherds are in fact hard hands who are in search of their own comfort and defraud the flock instead of feeding them. They protect themselves and run away from trouble instead of defending and warning the flock of danger. They do not want to cause controversy so they preach what people want to hear instead of what God has declared. However, to be a shepherd means to sacrifice one's life for the welfare of the community, to give one's life so that others may live. And following Jesus' example, who will lead us to invest our lives in the people that we save to the point where we don't matter anymore, but those that we save. Many of us have perhaps thought of ministry as a profession, but the ministry is not a profession. It is a vocation. It is a calling. We have been called by God into service. The ministry is not about us, but about the people we are supposed to save. And that is our calling. When we understand the ministry as a profession, then we only care about ourselves, our career, our success, our retirement, etc and not necessarily about the people we save or we ought to save. And we become hard hands, those who do not care for the sheep. But when we understand the ministry as a vocation, then we can care for others to the point of giving our lives for them. We will spend ourselves completely who we'll spend our resources, who we'll spend our time, and who we'll even spend our talents for the sake of those entrusted to our care. Jesus takes the metaphor of good and bad shepherds from the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 34, which speaks of the shepherds of Israel religious leaders who feed themselves. Shouldn't the 
shepherds feed the sheep. You eat the fat. You clothe yourself with the wool. You kill the fatlings. But you don't feed the sheep. Ezekiel chapter 34 verses 2 and 3. These bad shepherds are contrasted with God, the true shepherd. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 to 31. The passage concludes with God promising Israel, You, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, are men, and I am your God says the Lord Yahweh. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 31. Jesus further says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and I am known by my own. Even as the Father knows me, I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will hear my voice. They will become one flock with one sheep. John chapter 10 verses 14 to 16. I know my own and my own know me. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Knowledge here has to do with the knowledge that friends and family have of each other. That emotional tie between husband and wife, parents and children. That is why the analogy with God the Father is being made. Just as God knows Jesus, Jesus knows God. So also Jesus knows the community and the community know him. This intimate relationship between God and Jesus is so similar to that of Jesus and the community that one could say that through Jesus, God is intimately related to the community also. Jesus gives us the sense of awe, encompassing intimacy that brings in his relationship with the Father and extends to those whom the Father has given to him and to all who come to believe in him through the world. What Jesus is describing then is a grand extended family that begins with a loving father and through the love of the son embraces all believers. Jesus reminds us once again that he lays down his life for the sheep, a theme that we'll pick up again in John chapter 10, verse 17. Being a shepherd entails a constant living for one's sheep. And the shepherd status of Jesus the shepherd, in which all shepherding finds its true fulfillment, makes itself manifest in the sacrifice of his life, so that he may make his sheep the gift of true life. Jesus the good shepherd shows the full extent of his selfless love for the flock by dying for them. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep as a ransom for men. Shepherds were particularly vulnerable to two common external threats, namely thieves as well as world animals. And both threats are mentioned in this discourse. Thieves and robbers, as well as wolves. The thief is the false shepherd. And Jesus continues to say, 
I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will hear my voice. They will become one flock with one sheep. In the foregoing verse, Jesus is concerned as a good shepherd goes beyond the chosen people, the people of Israel. The Gentiles too must be brought into salvation together with the sheep of the fold of Israel. Both Jews and Gentiles alike are invited into the work of salvation and both have to respond to the one shepherd, Jesus Christ. When Jesus says, I have, he implies that these sheep already belong to him. But he has yet to bring them to the fold. Sure, Jesus is also reaching out to the people of Israel who had fled the Roman persecution. And as yet, they had not heard the good news. Jesus is so magnanimous. He wants no one to perish, but be saved. Further, we should not ignore God's word to Abraham, where he says, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Or indeed the touching moment when Simeon held the infant Jesus in, in his arms and said, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people, Israel. And dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we might not all be enclosed in one stockade, but we are all one and this is what Jesus intends to achieve, bringing us all together from different peoples and cultures into one people, the children of God. Unfortunately, we are heavily separated from one another on theological lines, ethnicity, education background, status, color, gender, etc. Such barriers are inappropriate among us Christians. Christ calls us to be one flock. A sheepfold is an enclosure or a coral where the sheep live when they are not grazing for food. It provides security and forces a sense of community. A good shepherd would be the type of servant to lie across the threshold of an open enclosure and also literally save as the door. And Jesus says that he will bring these other sheep also and there will be one flock, one shepherd. In conclusion, Jesus underscores the fact that the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down by myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. I receive this commandment from my Father. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, the Father loves me because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. And this is exactly what Jesus Christ was saying. He was willing to lay down his life. And he had absolute faith that God the Father would give his life back to him. And he, Jesus Christ, would be the receiver of that benefit from God the Father. He would receive his life back from God the Father. Specifically, it was not going to be the Roman power 
or even the Pharisees that would take out Jesus' life away. No, it was Jesus Christ himself who was unconditionally committed to laying down his life for our own shortcomings, for our own sins, so that we can win salvation. The Romans, the Pharisees, were nothing more than the agents in that process. Furthermore, the statement, this commandment I have received of my Father is a clear submission to God the Father by Jesus Christ, acknowledging that the restoration of life to Jesus Christ would depend completely on God the Father. Jesus laid his life down willingly. He acted in the authority that was given to him both to lay down his life and to take it up again. But he nevertheless did nothing on his own. All that he did was in perfect obedience to the will of the Father. Salient points for further reflections. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in our pericope of our catechesis today, we have noted four images within the story of the Good Shepherd. Namely, the Good Shepherd, Abundance, Hard Hand, and Wolf. We may be tempted to think that we are simply one of these. Most probably, we are all of them. And these images, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, are all part and parcel of each and every of us, pieces of our lives, ways that have been, and experiences that we have had and continue to make. Every one of us could tell a story when we were the good shepherd and we guided, protected, and nourish those entrusted to our care with that passion, with that zeal and vigor. For the good shepherd, the sheep are the goal and the reason for everything the shepherd does. The sheep are everything to the good shepherd, just as the family is everything for an individual. In the family, hopes and dreams are cherished as well as nourished. Losses are overcome, sorrows and fears are surmounted. Yet, we also have good and bad shepherds. The difference is in the heart. The good shepherd cares about the people those that have been entrusted in his or her care. The good shepherd seeks ways to lead faithfully and stands for what is right, even in the face of opposition or danger. However, we are also able to note with the turn of the time how we can become hired hands and run out on what we cherished and adored. When we assume that it was becoming risky for our personal survival and ran out on our spouse and ran out on our family and ran away on that troubled child, on that troublesome child, and ran out on the overprotecting parents, on those values that seem to restrict our perceived freedom, etc. A hard hand, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, takes off and runs away if it gets too difficult, too scary, and too. For the hard hand, however, 
The sheep are near means to their survival. Hard hands stay only as long as the wages are still good. The prospects still look positive and attractive. The hard hand either refuses to see or can't see the abundance that's already there. He would rather trade abundance for wages. That is the hard hand. The hard hand lives by quantity and not necessarily by quality. There is something about sheep that is abundance. It is their vulnerability, their honesty, and their way of hope that it will be better. They are full and whole and life-giving. And that is the more reason they matter and why we should care for each and every of them. It's why we receive that entrustment with great respect and honor. Someone comes to and says, you know what? I'm struggling in my life. Can I tell you what's going on? They are sheep asking for a shepherd's guide. Or you go to someone and say, I don't know what to do with my kid. Or I don't know how to get through this tough spot in life. I just need some courage or some encouragement and some hope. You are the sheep looking for a shepherd. These are the sheep that matter and are so valuable to spend ourselves for them. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, abundance is that quality of life. That lets us touch the deepest part of ourselves. It connects us with the divine, with the holy, and with what's good, true, and beautiful in this world. It's not so much about getting something we don't have, but living more fully into what is already present. That's Abundance is love that leads to love. It's joy that leads to joy. It is peace that leads to peace. It is kindness that leads to kindness. It is stepping more deeply and more fully into our own life and into the life of one another. It, is ne it never adds to the pain of the world. Abundance is Jesus' way of being in this world. In the presence of God, live through our life. Wolves destroy. Wolves snatch away. Wolves scatter. Wolves devour life. They destroy abundance. And wolves come in all sorts of shapes and sizes in our world. Sometimes it's the wolf of being busy, the wolf of achievement, the wolf of needing approval, or the wolf of having to be right at all times and in control. And at times, it is the wolf of fear or the wolf of anger and resentment. Or maybe it is the wolf of failure, the wolf of despair, the wolf of brokenness. And this destroys life at its roots. Let us pray. God our Father, your son's death and resurrection are the focal point of our human history. 
from Adam and Eve forward. Humanity looked forward in anticipation of the coming Redeemer. Since the resurrection, we now look back with gratitude for the redemption won for us by his death and the forgiveness of sin assured us. May his example as a good shepherd inspire us to save you and our neighbor sincerely. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.